Welcome to the Kingdom Business Forum, a program where we equip believers to advance the kingdom of God through business. I'm Vicki Norris. I'm Patrice Saguet. Now, I'm a business owner. I own an organizing products and services company called Restoring Order. We help people get organized at home and at work. And Patrice, he's the chief servant officer of Nehemiah Project International Ministries. And their biblical entrepreneurship training curriculum is a worldwide curriculum that changes businesses and people from the inside out. And I'm a living testimony of that. That's how I met Patrice. And so we're excited to bring you this program of the Kingdom Business Forum. We will be talking about church and marketplace ministry, Patrice. First of all, let's start it off by at least saying, what in the world is marketplace ministry? For those of you, for those of our listeners and viewers who don't know, what is marketplace ministry in the church? Okay, <laughs> what is that? Because a lot of people don't know their their church has not been ministering to the workplace person. They don't understand what it is. Simply put, it's funny. I was meeting with a college president this week, and. Um, and we would, and I use the term marketplace ministry, and I had to break it down for him because for most in academia, you, it's really called integration of faith at work. Integration of faith and at, work. And work, uh, within the context of the local church, and we're going to look at it in a minute. It's it's really called equip, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. The challenge, though, Vicky, is that traditionally. When you think about the work of the ministry, what do you think becomes the mind? Well, I'm not sure you want to ask me that because I <laughs> well, think what in church settings, a lot of people is, with, is the, the thing within within the wall. body, that's and right. that's what we're trying to that's change. Right. Not right. even the body, the the, 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 the local assembly. church, the, the local, local assembly. Right. You know, so when actually when you say equipping the saints for the work of the ministry, that's supposed to be the work of the ministry everywhere right and the, not body just the body of christ even in the world that's right each the one work, of us being ministers of ministry, reconciliation you got it so when you so marketplace ministry in the church is really about how that church equip its congregants to carry out their vocation in the context of ministry outside of the four walls you know, okay, so, so why really are we not seeing that i mean i i have to say that when i discovered marketplace ministry which was like two years ago when I met you, I, I felt like I've been living under a rock. I have been going to church for 22 years and nobody ever talked to me about this. My pastors over the various churches I had been to never spoke to the marketplace person, never heard a single sermon about the marketplace context. Like the disciples, you know, were marketplace people. They, you know, made tents. They were carpenters. They, I mean, they you know, and we don't really hear either things being taught from a marketplace perspective or equipping them with how to operate, you know, build character, uh, treat people, do business um, as believers. Why are we not seeing that? What, what is, has not fired yet? <laughs> well, I think in defense of the church, I think there's a, there are assumptions that a church makes, which obviously is flawed. The assumption is when you go to church on Sunday or Bible study or a small group, that you are hearing the gospel, you are being discipled or, or, or being engaged in the worship, and that that process, you're then taking that into your work. So they kind of leave it up to you for that application, hmm. right? Um, I don't think a lot of people are getting it. Yeah, <laughs> and so that's the challenge. So because what happens when you walk in church, because of the traditional model, you hear the gospel in the context of that, of the assumption that is is for the church. So even when the pastor, in cases where they do try to make to teach the message and tie it to your home, your family, your work, because of the fact that. Uh, the way the church engages you is often for the church. Right. It's institutional. You got it. Okay. So you never really make the, you never really take that direct application. At best, you may take it into your family. Right. You, know, you hear rarely, the Mother's Day message, the Father's Day message. Yeah. The, or you may, the message may help impact your family. Because, you know, the fact of the matter is if you're in a good church or you're hearing good teachings, it will have a relevance into your personal life. Right. But rarely do we go into the office and say, you know, let me show you what my pastor taught this Sunday. You know. I do. It, it was related to. <laughs> right. You know, but That's true. That, that doesn't. And then the other thing is people are not challenged to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, you that's follow true. Me? So marketplace, so part of the reason why it's not happening, I think number one is because people live compartmental lives. Right, it's disconnected. Disconnected. Two, it's easier for a pastor to be traditional. Because think about it. If I'm a pastor and I never worked outside of the four walls, in other words, my entire uh, career has been in the context of traditional church of, of, of vacation and ministry, then I don't really have, Vicky, the relevant application or even passion and interest. Oh, I don't have context I don't have is context. what you're saying. There's, there's no context to, for the pastor. You, you got it. So as a result, I'm going to just teach on holiness. Oh, because maybe he doesn't, he doesn't have experience. So he That's doesn't right. Like he can speak from it. And then wow. so I don't have a natural reaction to because I don't have the context for that. So that's that's the other dynamic. And then the other thing is, it is easier to just build a church. Mm. You know, that formula has been worked out. That's easier. It is more difficult to not try to get you, Vicky, to understand the importance of working in church ministry while at the same time working in your home marketplace ministry. Because mm. now, guess what? The risk is I'm dividing you mm. and I'm putting in a situation where I'm affirming both. Which means what? You're going to most likely choose what interests you best. Which right. most pastors think it would be your Wow, you've ministry. just said something really important. I mean, there's a fear that by equipping people to do this themselves, right. you're actually... I become maybe, irrelevant. Right. Wow. You get me out of business. Wow. You know, so... There's all those. And sometimes... Just don't, we might be I, getting hate mail after this program, Patrice. I just well, realized. <laughs> you know, Jesus, if, if he was alive today, he would be getting hate mail, wouldn't he? Right. He would. He <laughs> so would. Be good but boy, that's so true, Patrice. I mean, that if we are equipping each one to do it themselves, then we've, we've actually cut off their dependency upon us. That's right. Give an example. All right. You're a certified B teacher. That's right. I teach right. biblical You don't invite me in your class. I invited you once. <laughs> One time, <laughs> you taught two classes. So guess what? If I'm your pastor, right. you've worked me out of ministry. Wow. You, you found, if wow. I empower you, and then, Vicky, I've met some of your students, and the way they talk about your classes, it sounds like they enjoy your class better than with mine. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, so I can't help you there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so guess what? I mean, you know, so if Ooh. I'm not secure... Right. And then you may even have larger classes than me. Wow. Empowering and equipping right. takes security. That's right. You have to be secure That's and you right. have to understand the multiplication model that Jesus actually That's taught, right. which is that we're all priests. That's right. Wow. And one of your students I talked to, they didn't even need me because they got Vicky. <laughs> right? So mm -hmm. if if so if I'm not secure then it is hard for me to carry that forward. So let me kind of, you know, you asked the question, what is market ministry? I think we've answered this about equipping the saint, really, to, in the way, to, in, for the work of the ministry, meaning that whatever they do, they do it unto Christ. Let's look at Galatians chapter 3. I want to just kind of put this in context here. We're going to look at several key scriptures and kind of look at the application in terms of our teaching today. Uh, Galatians chapter 3. This is probably one of my favorite uh, scriptures, uh, and, and you'll you understand why. Now, Galatians chapter 3, look at what it says. And, and most people know this particular scripture. It says, verse 17 says, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do in word or deed. So what is Marcus ministry? It's about helping people to know that whatever they do, whether it's in the local church, whether it's in their political office, whether it's in their job, whether it's in their business, they are to do it in the name of Jesus. And whenever you do that, you are being engaged in ministry. So that's the first thing. And the question, though, is why marketplace ministry? You know, why is it important for us to equip people to understand that their ministry falls 
uh, is not should not just be limited within the four walls of the church. It's not just being a coffee server or you greeter. Got it. Right. Uh, there are two key reasons. But I want to look at another scripture that I want to uh, share with, with our listeners. Acts chapter 6, uh, verse 1 says, Now in those days when the number of disciples were multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve surmount the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom, whom you may appoint over this business. Now, <clears throat> the disciples here in Acts chapter 6, the, the church, because of the church growth, it brought about a need in, in, in the church. It was also brought about because of discrimination. But in any event, what well, the disciples realized that they could not leave the preaching of the gospel and prayer to meet the natural needs of, of the congregants that were, whose natural needs were not being provided for. In this case, it was the Greek-speaking Jews, uh, the widows of the Greek-speaking Jews. And so they said, oh, we got an idea. Why don't we identify among us seven individuals with some key characteristics, and by the way, the characteristics of these individuals were interesting because they had to be filled with the Holy Spirit, wisdom, and they had to have an honest report. I Meaning they had to be people uh, who were consecrated, people who were called, you know, people who had character, right? And then these people will take care of these, this business or these natural affairs. So why Marcus ministry? Because there are two distinct parallel needs within the context of the work of the gospel. One, obviously, the preaching of the word and prayer, the spiritual dispensation of the gospel. But the other is the natural resourcing or the natural provision of the needs of God's people in the world. And we can't have one without the other. Otherwise, we will not have a sustainable work or a sustainable body. So Markup's ministry is about recognizing that there are some among us who are not called, Vicky, to preach in a pulpit every Sunday. There are some who are not called to go out and form missions, uh, as traditionally is done. But there are some who are called to be politicians. There are some who are called to be builders. There are some who are called to be on the media, to be radio producers, uh, to be TV journalists, uh, to build businesses. And those needs are, I mean, those, uh, those products and services or those processes are, are essential for the advance of the gospel. They're just as important They're just as, as important the clergy. As everything else. As you see, the disciples saw that they saw these natural needs so significantly important that they set the bar, the criteria for the kind of people that were carried out forward. They set it very high. And, and so, so, why mock up his ministry? There are, there are two parallel needs in the body. The needs for natural uh, provision of resources mm -hmm. or the natural things of God, and the needs for the spiritual things of God. And both things are equally important. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they kind of work all together. It's not one versus the other, it's both end. Mm -hmm. The other question is how do we care? Do we do market, marketplace ministry. How now, does a church, how a local does a church assembly, locally do create market, a marketplace ministry right. or engage I, with I want to look at Ephesians, okay. Ephesians chapter 6. Love Ephesians. Now, <clears throat> again, some of these scriptures have been traditionally looked at within the context only of the four walls. And as we look at them here, we want to attempt to look at it within the context of the purposes of, of uh, the, the broad body or the kingdom. Actually, Ephesians chapter 4. Now, in Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to start reading at verse 11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the sons of God, of the Son of God, to a, to, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Here's what I love most. This is what it says. That we should, no longer be, we should no longer be children tossed to and fro, cared about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things unto him who is the head Christ 
from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edified itself in love. How, now, there are two ways a church might do that. First of all, churches are, called, are the equipping center of the people of God. The local assembly is the is intended the equi equipping, equipping center. Equipping center, that's correct. So some churches might have the internal capacity or internal resources because of the people of the church. For instance, the church that I belong to, I develop our training for our marketplace people. You know, whether it was financial stewardship, I developed that curriculum, uh, whether it was business, we have biblical entrepreneurship. So you have, to have the internal resources to, to uh, develop equipping tools mm -hmm. For your, uh, for your marketplace people or for your congregants that relates to their vocational activities outside of the four walls, helping them to be able to extend their ministry beyond the local church. You might have that internal capacity as a church, mm -hmm. which means you can do it internally, uh, empowering your uh, leaders to do that so you have that internal. But even if you do, there's some external resources you can tap into as well. But let's assume you don't, you can't do it internally. You can do it well outsource. You can partner with groups like, if in the Portland area, Nehemiah Project, FCCI, the Christian Chamber of Commerce, and there are groups like this. There's LARED uh, at an international level. There are various groups around the country that you can partner with or outsource the equipping aspect of your um, of your congregants when it comes to vocational activities or vocational ministry to those groups. But make sure though that as you're partnering with various groups, that those groups are, is, are consistent with your strategy and your ultimate vision. Because you don't want to bring a group in and, and also your flavor, the values of that ministry. Because just because it's a Christian group doesn't necessarily mean it fits in the context of your church or the vision of your church. There are some organizations that Nehemiah doesn't really fit in. Not because we're not a good work or they're not a good work. It's just that the, the, we don't gel together. So make sure it's the right fit and the right gel. You mean if you're a pastor out there or in church leadership and you're listening to this program and you're thinking, how can I absorb marketplace ministry into my church? You're saying check the different resources that are out there. There's plenty here in the Northwest start and even first nationally. Start internal, actually. But first, okay, so first start with what your vision is for your church, who you what, are. What resources you have internally. Because you may have people in your congregation who might love to champion this and might even be able to develop things That's that good. fit in the context of your church. That's good. Then you reach outside and partner up with other groups that might augment what you're doing or actually bring something that you bring can in a program. adapt it readily. I like that. Look inside first because um, I know I tried to get a meeting with a pastor one time, the, uh, the church I attended for nine months just to meet with him and say, hey, I'm a business person. What can I do? You know, I've, I'm trained in biblical entrepreneurship. What can I do to just bless the church, reach your marketplace people, help you with that? Because clearly it's not going on here. What can I do? How can I serve? And, and never did get a meeting. And I think there are, uh, I think I'm not the only one. There's probably a lot of business people out there that would love to be tapped for that, not just, see, I think what we're really talking about here, I think this program is going to cut through some serious religion, Patrice, because I think that when you talk about breaking down the four walls and get out of that boxed in thinking um, it can be threatening to some because well that's the way we've always done it and uh, I, th I think this is going to be um, hopefully really refreshing to many can you talk for a minute about the difference between taking on a program and making making marketplace people part of the DNA of your church have you seen that done successfully or maybe unsuccessfully yes the, the distinction is this is that, see a program is an activity that's not built into the fiber of the church. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we, we, a program is, it's, it's kind of like your children, right? Um, if, if you just turn, turn on a television and let them sit there and watch as a way to babysit them, right? The TV is babysitting the children. Versus where you get involved with the children and even watch the program with them. 
in, in, you know, in, in the part of what they're experiencing so that you might be able to discuss it with them and, and share that experience with them. There's a distinct difference. So take another program is bringing activity where has not been incorporated in the fiber of the church's strategy, vision, and values. That's not an outshoot of that. And so that you, in your mind, you're saying the activity alone will solve the problem. Right. That's a program. That's a program. Rather than um, when you, the other uh, alternative you said was, what term Well, making use? it part of, making well, making it part. Part of the DNA of the, the church. church. Like, remember Pastor Brian Crew in Metropolitan, Destiny Metropolitan Church in Atlanta, our friend, and um, I think he's on the board he's right. the, of, of the Nehemiah Project. They've really made marketplace ministry part of the fabric That's of right. their church. So it can't it can't just be one thing, right? That's it's right. a whole philosophy. That's, you got it. So it start with either evaluating your church vision and strategy and values and philosophy, and saying, is this an extension of that? And if it's not, do we need to revisit it? And by the way, you might decide that, it, that it's not and you're not going to visit it. But just having an activity is not going to necessarily do it. It's not enough. So can you talk a little bit about what about the kingdom business person who's listening to this program who's thinking, ah, I want to I talk to my pastor about this. I want to talk to someone in leadership. I want to see something started like this at my church. Where do they begin? What's your advice for how they should talk to their pastor? I think the first thing to do, typically most churches based on this size, have a department, another, another minister who is responsible for the area stewardship or this kind, something like this. Mm. So begin there. Adult ministries, Adult maybe. ministry, okay. whatever. Begin there. And if, if, if that doesn't exist, then we would pass it directly. Mm. But whether it's there or not, first of all, find out what's important to them. What about and gathering stakeholders too? Like if if I had maybe if I had talked to other people in the church, I didn't know very many people because I was new. But if I had talked to other business people who would like to see something started in the church, and then said, Pastor, you know, I meet with about a dozen people who have a real passion interest in this. Now that maybe they're seeing that there's a groundswell of interest in the challenge is ministry. if you're not involved in what's important to them first, mm. then you don't you've not gained the credibility oh, that's for good. them, and that's the challenge. That's good. So so you've got to find out what is important to them. And sometimes, Vicki, you may need to join what's important to them and help them make that succeed. Because sometimes pastors, I mean, you know, I'm a leader, you're a leader. Imagine somebody calling you and saying, I want to do X, Y, and Z. We have other priorities. If they can help you achieve your priorities, the likelihood of you helping them achieve their priorities is higher. Okay. You know, That's so great what's advice. important to them? Because see, what you're proposing may not fit in their current priority. So help them realize the current priority. That allows to build relationship, build trust, which then empowers, put in, put you in a position where they can trust you to empower you to help them find answers for other things. Serve first is what you're saying. Okay, in one minute, tell us how biblical entrepreneurship can be a tool for the local church, please. Well, what's unique about BE is that the local church can adapt it and make it a zone. So if a local church wants to equip its business members and the business, the, the members of, of the business community in the community where they serve, uh, they can either have us come and run a training program for them or they can identify leaders in the, in the church that can be certified to run it for them. They can even private label it to make it something that they own, they operate, as if see fit with them through a licensed model. The other thing, Vicki, uh, soon we're going to release a secular version of BE, meaning biblical entrepreneurship without the Bible. Uh, that sounds weird, right? But it's called doing business with purpose and profitability, which means churches can use this to train non-Christian business people as a way to build, to do relational evangelism in their community. Oh, I like that. Now we're thinking outside the four walls. That's good, Patrice. Well, I sure hope that whether you're a pastor or business person, uh, whether you own your business or you're an employee, I hope that you've been blessed today. I hope you've been thinking about how you could help bring Marketplace Ministry to your local assembly and equip 
every person to become a minister of reconciliation, a priest, because that's what each one of us are called to do. And we hope that the Kingdom Business Forum is a useful tool for you as you bring Kingdom principles to your life and business. Do find us on Facebook at Kingdom Business Forum. Thank you for tuning in today to the Church and Marketplace Ministry on the Kingdom Business Forum.